Good afternoon. Uh, we have all the stars out tonight. All our chairs are here and many of our finest students. Um, but for those of you who may not know, my name is Ronald Bear. I'm the interim dean of the Brown University School of Public Health. Welcome to the 24th annual Dr. and Mrs. Frederick Barnes Lecture in Public Health. This is National Public Health Week. Yesterday, we had an extraordinary research day that highlighted the work of many of our students, both, I mean, not both, but all undergraduates, master's students, and our, our doctoral students. It was truly an extraordinary day. We got over 160 presentations or posters, twice that we've, the number we've had in, in the past years. Um, but today, we will be continuing our celebration of National Public Health Week with a conversation that will be focused on the ongoing issues surrounding the MPOX outbreak with the White House National MPOX Coordinator, Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis. Before we get started, I wanna remind everyone that today's event is being recorded and will be available on our websites. During the first full week of April, the American Public Health Association um, <clears throat> brings together communities across the United States to observe National Public Health Week. The School of Public Health has been deeply engaged in this event since the year 2017. We have partnered with many organizations, both on and off campus, with the goal of making the world healthier, safer, and more productive. Thank you for sharing and observing National Public Health Week with us. And before we introduce today's speaker, let me quickly tell you about the Barnes Lecture. It started under the leadership of Vince Moore, who at the time was the chair of the Department of Community Health, which is, represents the origins of the School of Public Health. Since then, it has continued throughout the tenure of the deans of the School of Public Health, Fox Weddle, Bess Marcus, and Ashish Jha. Today's barn lecture is the keynote event during our National Public Health Week. I would like to say a bit about Dr. Fred Barnes. Dr. Barnes came to Brown in 1962 as a founding member of the new program in medicine at that time, which as you all know, went on to become a school of medicine and is now celebrating its 50th anniversary. He was so excited about the prospect of developing physicians with the framework of a great liberal arts college that he began teaching Brown undergraduates a wildly popular course entitled The Informative Way of Life. That's very Brown. One of his students, Jim Sisson, class of 1974, endowed the lectureship because he viewed Dr. Barnes as a quintessential physician scholar. I would like to thank the Barnes family, Jim Sisson, for and Jim Sisson for creating and supporting this lecture series. And now I will turn things over to our Deputy Dean, Dr. Megan Ranney. Thank you, Ron. I am thrilled to introduce today our esteemed guest, Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis. Uh, Dr. Daskalakis, or Dr. D, as he has become <laughs> dearly known to our SPH uh, staff in organizing this event, is an infectious disease physician who currently serves as deputy coordinator of the White House National MPOX response. Prior to his appointment, he served locally and nationally as a leader in public health, as the director of the Division for HIV Prevention at the CDC, deputy commissioner for the Division of Disease Control, and Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of HIV at the New York City Department of Mental Health and Hygiene, kind of the equivalent of their DOH. Dr. Daskalakis is recognized internationally as an expert in HIV prevention and has focused much, if not all, of his career on the treatment and prevention of HIV, STIs, and other, as we will talk about, syndemics as an activist physician with a focus on LGBTQ plus communities. He has also served in leadership roles during several other public health emergencies, as we will discuss. 
And I will say, I first met him bowling at the White House. It's true. So it is a true pleasure to be up here with him, not with kind of gross bowling shoes on, but actually with us looking a little nicer. And, and it's just an absolute joy to be able to welcome him here um, to Sales Hall and to Brown University. Not surprisingly, the only other person who was a fabulous bowler was Dr. Ja. Yes. <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> he was actually far better. He is us. a very yeah. good bowler. <laughs> the unknown skill sets of people around you. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm really excited to have him just to give you guys a structure for what we're going to do. It's going to be really a fireside chat. We're going to do about 40 minutes of my asking questions and then hearing Dimitri opine and share his experiences, share his thoughts, and then we'll close with about 20 minutes of audience Q&A. So as we're talking, I do welcome you to kind of take the chance to think about what you want to know, um, what you'd like to share. Um, we're very much looking forward to that conversation. After the Q&A, we will have about 30 minutes of mingling, uh, enjoying crudite and various beverages of your choice, um, and to have a chance to have more um, up close and personal time with Dr. Daskalakis and with each other. I also want to say before we start just what a treat it is to be here in person. Last year's lecture was online, and just how much I welcome the chance to see so many faces here. Um, thank you all for coming out on this relatively cold and gloomy April day. <laughs> so without uh, further ado, Dimitri, I would love to start by having you share a little bit about your journey. What prompted you to pursue medicine and public health? And what brought you into public service? Sure. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor, um, especially to be here um, for the Barnes Lecture, given the legacy that that represents. So uh, thank you all. And uh, thanks to uh, the Dean's Office and everyone for um, organizing the sometimes complex structures of getting through government approvals to <laughs> let something happen. So thank you. Um, so I wanted to be, I'll start with the doctor part. Like, so I wanted to be a medical doctor um, since I was two years old and I met my Fisher Price kid. True story. Aww. True story. And um, I had no doctors in my family. My parents were immigrants from Greece. My mom was a secretary and my dad was a, worked in restaurants um, all of his life. So I didn't really have a particular role model. And so it was something I wanted to do. And I always really liked science and biology and all of that. And so I um, you know, went to college and uh, decided I was going to be pre-med, um, but then also decided I was gonna be a biology and religion double major. Love it. I know, it's pretty great. Those things go very well together. Um, so we had, uh, it was a, a fascinating experience. And in that time, I moved to New York at 17 years of age, um, which is where I went to college and um, you know, really entered the universe of a little bit of nightlife in New York, frankly, and like started to meet people. Uh, this was 1991 and make friends. And then my friends would disappear. Mm. And so they would uh, end up at this scary hospital called Bellevue, which ultimately became my favorite place in the world. But um, ultimately um, they would disappear because they would get sick. And so um, the sort of notion of becoming a, a, a physician became more real um, when I realized that I would be really interested in doing work in the space, specifically LGBTQ uh, health, not knowing that that's what it was called, um, really looking as HIV as the way to get there. And I had a pretty pivotal moment in my um, undergrad time where in 1995, I helped put on this display of the um, AIDS Memorial Quilt. If you haven't seen it, it's now digital. So you can go online and see it if you can't go see it in person. But it is literally large pieces of cloth with memorialized names of people who passed away. And um, during that um, display, we rolled the quilt out at, on Columbia's campus. Sorry, Brown. Columbia's campus. And, um, and we opened the gates. And all of a sudden, there were people who came who seemed like they were barely able to walk because they were so ill and came to sort of remember the people that they lost and they themselves were so sick. And I had the aha moment of sort of standing on college walk at Columbia and going, so I think what I need to do is never let anyone suffer like this again. And that's what I'm gonna do. And so um, went to medical school, went to NYU, um, 
snuck onto the HIV, it was called the AIDS ward then, mm -hmm. but snuck onto the AIDS ward because they didn't let medical students on the AIDS ward. But there is a physician who now works for the Department of Health in New York, Charles Gonzalez, who let me sneak in. And so I would round with him as a little first year and second year on my spare time. And so I got to sort of meet people living with HIV. And you know, I got to see some pretty horrible things like transgender women who had HIV who were in rooms and like people would just throw the food at them, they wouldn't go in. All of that bad stuff was still going on. It still goes on now, um, but more so. Mm -hmm. And so I made it through there and decided that I was gonna do an infectious disease fellowship. And I ranked things in order of where I thought I would get the best training, uh -huh. um, regardless of city. And so, you know, the New Yorker always wants to stay in New York. And then I open my envelope and it's, congratulations, you're going to Beth Israel Deaconess for residency. And I did, and that was fantastic. And then I did my infectious diseases at Mass General in the Brigham. And um, gosh, this is a long story, but I'm getting there. I love um, it. Whew. So um, I eventually went into the uh, laboratory where I was doing acute HIV uh, immunology. So I was doing CD4, CD8 immunology. Um, for those, most of you don't know me, if you can imagine me in a lab by myself, the cells didn't talk back to me. So I wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't really good. So I was there doing immunology and there was this news flash that came across the radio mm -hmm. yeah, um, in the lab. And the radio said that there was a, a case of acute HIV infection with rapid progression, multi-drug resistant that happened in New York. And I was just like, I love the lab. This is really exciting. I love Mass General and the Brigham. I need to go back. Yeah. So I got on the phone to Judy Aberg, that some of you may know, who is an mm -hmm. infectious disease doctor and big HIV investigator in New York. And I, I called her and I said, I really need to come home. And so she made that happen. Oh. I know. So I got a position at, at Bellevue, the same place that used to scare me when I was a kid, a position at Bellevue. And... Um, this is where the story changes into public health. Mm -hmm. So um, that case of rapid HIV progression, um, there was some very cursory molecular epidemiology that was done on it, like very sort of not, not sort of the way that we do now. And they identified the strain and it seemed as if the interaction that led to that infection happened at a commercial sex venue in New York City. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I need to do HIV testing in the commercial sex venue. So that's how the public health career Sorry. began. So I got a backpack, maybe stole some HIV testing kits, maybe, and um, with some permission, and went into the, uh, into the, the environment and started doing HIV testing and uncovered a positivity rate of 13%. Wow. Yeah. And the people who were positive tended to be uh, people of color, often not from the US uh, in terms of their uh, place of birth. So that was very instructive. And um, I like to say that um, rather than having the idea of risk be abstract, um, you really need to understand risk. And so that taught me a lot. So then eventually, and this is where the story, get, get the hankies out. Um, so <laughs> what happened was, I didn't, I didn't have any formal public health training and, and I'm a big believer that formal public health training is really important. So since sitting here on public health uh, week, it's really important to say, very important to have formal public health training. <laughs> um, and I had uh, a family uh, donated money to NYU and said, we wanna mentor one person's career. This is where the hanky comes out. Um, and that person needs to be someone who will never let anyone die the way our son did which has that resonance to like my aha moment of wanting to do HIV. And so um, they supported me to get my, my master's of public health. And then it all unfolds from there. I applied to be the commissioner for, uh, assistant commissioner for HIV. And then it goes from there into a public health career. I love that. And I love the way that you tell the story, you know, as, as I'm kind of following and listening and utterly engaged from the Fisher Price kit, which I think we can all <laughs> imagine up through the, the service um, in New York, that kind of true north, that motivation that brought you through. I think one of the things that I frequently hear in discussions with the students um, and with our postdocs and, and doctoral students and sometimes with our junior faculty is the sense of like, how do I figure out what the right step is? And, and I, one of the things that I really wanna appreciate about your story is that it was a series of 
kind of happenstance, but it was always motivated by this is the thing. And those series of experiences just put you in a place where you could then make a next choice. Yeah, I feel like in so many ways, if you have your eyes on your goal, it's the North Star. I'm gonna use your words, it really is. It sort of guides you and, and you just have to be ready. This is a great sort of moment. You just have to be ready for twists and turns and you have to be ready to sometimes be willing to take a risk. I mean, I think you can speak to this too. Like I, you know, I was a clinician yeah. and then I went to my, the School of Public Health and I learned many, many things. And oops, I didn't realize I was doing public health programming the entire time. Because to me, I was like, oh, it's just clinical work. It's not. And, you know, every time I did like a twist, I had anxiety. Yeah. But I think the only things I've ever regretted in my career is where I didn't take the leap. The leap. So you just took a really big leap, speaking of which. Sure. Well, not just just, but relatively <laughs> recently in the terms of a career, you know, about yeah. a year ago, um, you took this leap to the White House. Yeah. So tell us about that. What, what, what was it like to get the phone call, I have first a of very all? good friend, Dr. Josh, <laughs> gave me a call. <laughs> and he I think you all are familiar with him. <laughs> like, yeah. So literally, you know, I think I was, it, it kind of goes a little bit deeper in MPOX before I got the call. So I had been working um, with CDC. You know, I think one of the things that's really interesting about the MPOX story is, you know, it, it goes to the sort of universe of the subject matter expert right away. Mm -hmm. And so pox viruses went to pox people. Mm -hmm. And then they were like, oh no, this is a little different. And so um, Dr. Walensky, mm -hmm. um, Rochelle from CDC, um, from the very beginning of the outbreak said, we really need to engage people in the sort of HIV STI world even early on because they understand the population. Yeah. So I got pulled into the MPOX response because of the fact that I understood the population, however well anyone can understand a population since it's not, uh, it's heterogeneous. It's not a monolith, yeah. Right, so, um, so that soon thereafter because of sort of being in some ways to some people a trusted messenger, mm -hmm. my voice got louder and louder in the MPOC story to the point where, you know, they, they sort of name requested me from CDC to come in and really help coordinate um, on the White House level, sort of this, this meta coordination because, you know, there was coordination happening, but uh, a more aerial view to be able to sort of manage what was happening in this um, fairly complex outbreak. Well, and I will say as an outsider watching it, your and Fenton's arrival really made a difference in terms of that kind of 30,000 foot. The community. odd couple. <laughs> well, you, you are a little bit of, I mean, if you put the two of you together also, you're like, it's, it's, you are definitely an odd couple. It's You've got like the yeah. FEMA guy and the like. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, so it, it really is. So it was, it, it was funny because, you know, I'd never met him and he'd never met me and he always jokes that um, when they called him, he's like, you seem to m misunderstand that the last initials in my name are JR, not MD. And so he was like, who's coming with me? <laughs> and so it ended up um, that we actually are not much, are not really an odd couple mm. because he's sort of the master of FEMA disasters. Like he does like hurricanes and fires and, you know, lava flows in Hawaii, which pulled him <laughs> away from me from a while. and. Uh, what, what are they called? Atmospheric rivers, is that yeah. what it's called? In, in California, all of those things. And so, um, and I had the background of leading a lot of infectious disease events. And so, um, though I identify myself as an HIV, infectious disease HIV doctor, um, you know, when I was at the Department of Health in New York, I led lots of Legionella responses. You haven't lived until you've done that. <laughs> Lots of Legionella responses. <laughs> um, measles, um, the largest measles outbreak in the U.S. in Orthodox decades. In the yeah. community, yeah. And so, like, n like, put a pin in that. Like, the skills that you get, get in community from HIV are the same skills that I use with measles. Mm -hmm. And then, like, okay, I'm going to take a little sidetrack here. Please. This is a good one. So one of the things that was so interesting was that the last, the last people, the last person, that, um, that the um, Orthodox Jewish community in Brooklyn wanted to, wanted to listen to about what to do with measles vaccination was me, okay. right? Like Greek they were, guy. I lived in Williamsburg <laughs> like, a block away, it was fine. But like it's, it, but literally, <laughs> 
it didn't work. And so we ended up doing the sort of taking a page out of the HIV book and saying like, how do you like stimulate trusted messengers? Like who are the people mm -hmm. that they'd listen to? And the answer was um, physicians and specifically, and nurses and specifically female physicians and nurses. So we, we activated um, the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association, JAMWA, and also the Nurses Association. And they're the ones that reached out to mothers to really help stimulate so much action in vaccination that really led to um, the outbreak coming to a close. So, so back to Bob. So we are similar in that. And oh, and then I was the incident manager in New York City Department of Health um, from January 2020 until November 2020 for COVID. So um, we, we, I've learned to do small and large events. And so Bob and I actually had this very interesting, you know, some genes that were similar in terms of being folks that know how to do or have been engaged in um, emergency responses. So we were a little odd, but definitely it was a great combo. Like he was like very logistical I mean, he landed and we had a work plan in like 24 hours. I love it. Like, like total FEMA moment. I was like, whoa, <laughs> like what just happened here? Like all of a sudden you're like, he, you know, he sat with me, I'm the SME. We talked about the pillars that we had to do. We talked about the lines of effort. We had to talk about the sort of deliverables and, you know, he activated some of his FEMA crew. And then like, you know, 24 hours later, we have this entire strategy that's based on like what I was talking to him about as being like important um, sort of milestones and, and, and pillars and like we stuck to it. And I, I love that as a great example of how kind of the greatest public health successes are when we move beyond our own disciplinary boundaries that you cannot do yeah. public health if you don't have people that do logistics and mm -hmm. planning and private sector work. Right. And we learned, I mean like COVID exquisitely taught us that events, public health events aren't just public health. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it's really interesting when you hear about pandemic and I don't want to sort of encroach on people's pandemic preparedness universes because I know you all are super leaders in this. But I'm mm -hmm. um, sort of the, the sort of preparedness piece where you're like, we talk to Treasury and we talk to like this agency and we talk to, you know, employment. And during that sort of time when it was happening, the pandemic, people understood it, but others were like, well, why is it happening? And then when like it hits and you realize that you become the best friend of Department of Education, like, right. who, like it, just, it just shows you that these events aren't just medical or public health events, but public health events are in fact all hands on deck. And one of those things that we were just talking about as we were conversing before we came up here is about kind of those relationships. Oh, yeah. And, and the fact that you, the relationships that you have created over a career, you were then able to carry into these emergency situations, these moments of uncertainty, and call on them to get support. I'm going to tell the same story. Please? I think it's so, yeah. it's so informative in terms of uh, response. So I had the great opportunity to go and uh, speak at another school of public health about, in a very small group, not... Don't, don't be jealous, um, a, <laughs> a smaller group about the MPOX response. And um, I got there early and I didn't know what was on the agenda before me, but I was there for the folks who were the responders for the Boston Marathon bombing. And the, uh, the gentleman who eventually became the chief of police in Boston um, started talking about what worked mm -hmm in terms of their coordination, because I think it's held up as a great example of coordination. And he said in this like lovely Boston accent, it's because we're just such, we have such good sports teams. And we were all like, I don't understand. And he goes, we have had so many, you know, championships that we've won and so many large scale parades and so many large scale events that to get to those events, we know everybody. So you know people from all the corners. And he goes, so when we had this like cataclysmic event happen, we already knew each other. And so at MPOX, and we were talking about this on the way here, like since MPOX entered the interacting epidemics made worse by social determinants, AKA syndemics of HIV and STI, um, also mental health and substance, substance abuse. abuse. Yeah. yeah, when it entered that syndemic, it was like, wait a minute, I've already drilled with these people <laughs> because yeah. of HIV. And so it was really a familiar moment, like that the, pol the guy from the police who said, it's because I knew everyone because of the sports games. I guess like our sport at this time was chronic infectious disease response. 
<laughs> but, and I'll go back to that like North Star, which is like you've been following this mission and it gave you this tool set that you never would have expected to call on if someone had said to you two years ago <laughs> that you were going to be running MPOX at the White House. Got a story for you. When, <laughs> this is a good one. Do. When I got interviewed, <laughs> this is one of my favorite, favorite tales. And I got interviewed to be the uh, assistant commissioner for the Bureau of HIV. Uh -huh. uh, you may know the person who interviewed me. He was the deputy commissioner, Jay Varma. Mm -hmm. Right, there you go. That's awesome. Jay, Jay is great. And Jay uh, interviewed me for this job and we were talking about like what I'd have to do. And he goes, oh yeah, yeah, by the way, a component of this is emergency response. So every now and then you may get pulled into these things for a couple of weeks at a time and then it'll be fine. Meanwhile, I would say three quarters of my public health career has been pulled into these little things. Yeah. And so it's just fascinating. And like, then applying that skill set, using, totally. those, using those skills, those disciplinary, the ability to collect data, yes. the ability to act on limited data sets, the ability to create community coalitions, yeah. I, I, rinse I, and repeat. And also it flips the other direction as well. And so the things that you learn from the acute response ends up being so important in addressing chronic infectious diseases as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the things, you know, a great example, um, which I don't think I would have like conceived of had I not been doing response was, um, you know, we in New York used HIV resources, CDC HIV resources, to build um, a very interesting strategy in our sexual health clinics. Mm -hmm. And that was to um, actually build lab capacity in the sexual health clinic. And so there's a clinic oh, in, um, it's, you're gonna love it. There's a clinic in, in London called Dean Street Express. So for those of you who are HIV, STI nerds, see, I, I found one. Um, you know what I'm talking <laughs> about. And so this clinic had um, instruments in it that allowed for rapid diagnosis of gonorrhea and chlamydia, which tends to be slow boat, can take like a week, and then mm -hmm. you miss some opportunities for preventing transmission. And so we stole the idea, translated it New York City style, and put instruments in the big, in one of the big, um, one of the big clinics. And um, we then started plans for the new public health laboratory. And I managed to get everyone to agree that we were going to put a clinical space in the base, in the, in the main entrance of, uh, of the new public health laboratory hmm. with these instruments so that we can do, right, gonorrhea, chlamydia testing, but then as I like to say it, flip it um, during an emergency into uh, response for other things. And so what ended up happening was that um, when COVID hit, um, with the the, um, the lab capacity money that came from CDC, we purchased more of those instruments and all of the sexual health clinics got those instruments and all became rapid COVID testing sites. I love it. Demonstrating the point. And so now they're flipping back into STI testing. And now they have enhanced capacity and it's a great example of, we often talk about, oh, the COVID exactly. money has disappeared. We're losing all these resources. So you thought from the get-go about how to make sure that there was some continuity. Exactly, and we, we sort of had this sort of conceptual idea of flipping back and forth, and then we had like the stress test and actually had to do it. Yeah. And so now they're, they're, they're flipping back to gonorrhea, chlamydia, huh. um, but that infrastructure is there and is kept warm in effect by managing what you need for the chronic infectious disease. An idea for our new Rido building that's being built. I'm just gonna put it out there. Um, so, I don't know what that building is, oh, do Rhode it. Island Department, <laughs> there's a new Rhode Island Department of Health laboratory building yeah. that's being built. I mean, so. It's, so, I'll say- it, I don't know that, we're not in charge of it. So I'm, I'm just- it was, it was complicated <laughs> because you know, the, 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 the part that's funny, we talk, had a little side conversation about this is that very often with, you know, clinical care and public health, like there seems to be like some odd confusion. Yeah. And so the idea of putting a clinical space in a public health lab made the hospital <laughs> system get a little concerned. And then what we did was sell it to them and say, well, when we find the gonorrhea, chlamydia cases and the HIV cases, like we're gonna refer them to you and then you're gonna have them in longitudinal service. And that became a check mark and we were able to get it through planning. Which is also the reality of public health. You have to consider all your constituencies. So there are two other things I really want to get to before we open it up to audience questions. One is, uh, I want to talk about some of the really impressive messaging that you did COVID, mm. during COVID oh. around sex positivity and around kind of allowing people to still be their full selves while also protecting themselves from COVID. That kind of harm reduction messaging, which is so much of a part of so much of what all, we all do. But New York City... Um, Department kind of Health and Human Services, I think you guys were just set the standard in terms of that. 
But I can imagine now being in kind of the position that I'm in that you probably had to go through some stuff from up above to get permission for it, but you also probably got some groundswell of critiques from below. And so I would love to hear both about, I, I would actually love to hear about kind of how you got that messaging through and, and kind of what your experience was. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with it, I, I encourage looking it up because it's just to me a gorgeous um, and brilliant <laughs> uh, example for us all to replicate as we think about public health communication. Yeah, that was, so I think it's, I think that there's a lot of sort of embedded things about that that are instructive. And I'll start going back to, I think, your hypothesis, which is correct, in my opinion, about the North Star. Mm -hmm. So never let an emergency go by without taking advantage of it. That's very important in whatever way that you can. And so when we had the opportunity to put out, so I, I sort of framed, we're getting a lot of questions about people who don't know what to do from the perspective of intimacy and sex with COVID. Mm -hmm. So we should probably come up with a guidance. And so that's how it began. So very in that space. And then we wrote the guidance um, and ex like took the perspective that this is a chance to sort of push the envelope mm -hmm. for other things that we need to do in the future for what we can say. And so like people tend to be very responsive during an emergency and you can push the envelope a little bit better than you can during business as usual during peacetime. So we created this document that really went through like all of the ideas, the best practices that we could come up with about how you could prevent, um, prevent transmission of COVID in a sexual scenario. And we did not hold back. So no, you didn't. we did not hold back. So we were, we were very clear about, you know, you, you know, use virtual sex, use, you know, like for sex workers, um, if you're, if you're not able to do sex work in person, use platforms that you can, that pay platforms so that you're able to still make a, make, a make money and make a living, um, without putting yourself at risk. Like we, okay, this is a little off color, but I mean, it is after all me. So you know, we, we decided that one of the things that we were going to say was like create you know, some sort of barrier between people so they can still have sexual encounters without face-to-face -face, um, interaction. And so we actually, in the document, had the word glory hole in, in the document. But wait, and then the pushback from above was glory hole is dirty. And so instead, we changed it to um, use barriers to allow for sexual interaction without face-to-face -face, uh, encounter. That sounds dirtier, <laughs> indeed. But, but, but it got through the It got the through, we, we did it. Mm -hmm. Canada then stole it and they put Glory Hole in and then it was very funny, go Canada. So, um, so we, we pushed the envelope there and then like, you know, what happened was like people were responsive. They actually like posted the, the, the guidance everywhere. It was one of the more popular guidances that came out in, in, in that era of COVID because people were really interested and wanted to have questions. Did they giggle a little bit? Sure. That's fine. But like they also got attention. Got to, yeah. Uh, we got, we made it on like, you know, Jimmy Fallon. I mean, like it was everywhere. Awesome. SNL. That was, we got, we made it on SNL. And so that was pretty pretty great. And how did you deal with the pushback? Because I'm sure you got some hatred uh, directed at you about that. Sure. So ultimately, you know, you can't be everyone's hero. You have to be a hero to the people that really need you to be their hero. Mm. And so ultimately, like for us, you know, I think from the personal perspective, like your ego in public health always has to go on the side because someone is always unhappy with what you're doing. Um, as And I think if you really sort of stay close to what you think are the principles of public health and, and the communities that you serve, it's okay. And so definitely we got some pushback and, you know, but we also got a lot of, you know, people who were very enthusiastic. Translate that into MPOX, you know, where I, you know, we, we had a very similar scenario and um, we pushed, CDC pushed, we, we, we pushed the envelope at CDC real nice yeah. in, ter in terms of what we can do. And so the MPOX guidance that was about safer sex in the era of MPOX, um, ended up being um, pretty pretty clear, but there is this backstory. Uh-huh. This we is a, get, the, get ready. No. It always goes back to your North Star. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna steal this North Star Please, thing from you. Please, be my guest. So it's, it always it. goes back to the North Star. <laughs> and so what, in, in the early 80s, um, there was a document that was produced by the community that was called How to Have Sex in an Epidemic, One Approach. And it was written by Michael Callan, and gosh, it's gonna, lightning's gonna strike. I can't remember the other human right now. 
two folks wrote this, this um, document, and it was a harm reduction strategy for sex um, before we knew HIV was HIV. Mm. And so they just like looked around and came up with best practices because public health wasn't doing its job. Its job. And so, um, you know, when you start to relive the lessons of, of your past, if you don't learn from those lessons, then you failed. And so when, when COVID struck, I was like, we're not going to let other people come up with this. We're going to do our public health job and we're going to write this document for COVID and then do the same thing for MPOX. And so it actually goes right back to the North Star and is a, con a continuum of lessons learned in HIV that got pulled into these other infections. I love it. Okay, my last question, I, we've like barely kind of gotten to the tip of the iceberg here of all the things that I want to talk about. But my last question, I know that a lot of our students um, and many of our faculty have an interest in public service. And many folks over the course of their public health career are going to go in and out of public service. And so I, I would love to just kind of end with some reflections from you as a public servant about both um, the strengths and the potential weaknesses of, of this position? Kind of what, what are the special things that you get to do and, and have an impact on that you're really appreciative of, but what are some of the things that have surprised you in terms of limitations um, of these roles? And I won't make you point at CDC or New York City oh, no, no, or, it's or good. White House, but yeah. Um, what a great and complicated question. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there's, I think that there's, from the public health perspective, mm -hmm. so being someone who is, you know, a public health, professional, someone who's had training in public health and has um, been on the non-governmental side the of the work. The activist side. Right. Mm -hmm. The activist side, the, the grantee side, the recipient side, mm -hmm. um, the academic side. Um, it's really exciting to be at a table where you are able to sort of make decisions resourced in a way that you can't even imagine. So that's like, there's nothing, it's amazing. Like, and I, I joke sometimes that when you think about the, you know, at, at New York State Department of Health, it was like in the, you know, you're, you had a certain number of zeros. And then when you got to CDC, you, got, you added a couple more zeros. <laughs> at the White House, you just add more zeros. Like, so it's like you have this like bigger vision of resources that you can, that, that you can use. And it's really exciting. Um, the other part that's exciting is I go back to that table, is that if you're doing public health right, it means that you have to um, really work on generating political will, mm -hmm. but then also be really good at, at the community engagement that lets you actually implement the science that you need to be able to get to your goals. Yeah. And so um, at that table where you're making decisions, if you are not pulling in the community that you serve to that table next to you, lesson from HIV, you are going to fail. Mm -hmm. And so like the opportunity to do that as well and bring like voices that sometimes aren't heard, like to the place of power to be able to Love make it. those decisions is great. On the flip side, <laughs> <laughs> government is really slow. And so, um, so it's, it's a challenge because, you know, even when you think something is really urgent, um, you can push and push and you do achieve, I think, some ability to accelerate things, but there are also some moments that are, um, that are slow. Another really good thing to know as a public health professional is never take the answer no as an absolute in government, mm. ever. It's a good lesson in life in general. It is, <laughs> it is, but like, but very often there is like a mythology of what you can and can't do either from a legal or regulatory perspective. Mm. And the answer is show me the money, show it to me on paper where I can't do this. And I'll give an example mm -hmm. with MPOX really quickly. So um, you can't use HIV and, and STI money to do MPOX work. You can't use substance abuse money and resources to do MPOX work. And you certainly can't use money from the housing authority to do MPOX work. False, 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 and false. So we created flexibilities across all of those after a lot of people said no. And, and it wasn't the agency saying no, the agencies were like, I don't know, like it's kind of strange. But then when you actually go below the surface, the no is only based on a mythology, not actually on regulatory or legal standing. It's not about secret congressional language that doesn't let you do it. It's, it's permissive if you actually make the argument of what you're doing. And so, um, so. It's legacy and, and habit. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, and the other part is, you know, and we talked about this on the way here where it's like systems are in general bad. 
Like, and so identifying ways that you can make a system work as your tool to get to your goal is one of the fun parts of government. If that sounds daunting to you, then government's not for you because it's part of the joy, right? Which is weird to say that like working through crazy administrations and working through like strange murky, like things that get in your way is fun, but it's like the most exciting puzzle when it looks like there's no way to do it. And then you're like, wait a minute. I found, I found the path. Yeah, sometimes you beat your head against the wall, but, but it's, it's like, it's the plus and the minus that like, you know, that when healthcare isn't perfect or public health isn't perfect, you have to figure out how to make it sing to achieve your goal. Mm -hmm. And it's that figuring out the path, it's mm -hmm. the ride that is um, almost as fun as getting there. I love it. What a, well, I'm, I'm gonna open up for questions. Um, I, I am sure that you all are just as enthralled and full of um, queries as I am, so, but I wanna give you all a chance to, to ask. Dr. Wilson. And I'll, I'll, I can repeat, oh, we have a mic, perfect. Oh, good. Uh, let, me, let me ask you to build a little bit on the messaging and communications sure. theme we, we've developed. Um, so the MPOX um, epidemic or whatever uh, experience um, was an interesting, uh, was interesting because there were communities affected, there was modes of transmission, there was the potential for stigma, there was the desire to create safety, and I wondered in, in retrospect, based on kind of where you are now, what you learned about communication strategies in balancing those, those interesting um, uh, effects. We were, it's a great, it's such a good question. And again, we, we, we covered this. We did, you did a good job warming me up on the <laughs> way here. So, we, so one of the things that I found really important was when you look at people and tell them to do something and don't have any data to back it up, it just doesn't work as well. I know that, that isn't, that's like not the most seismic thing that's ever been said. But sort of saying, don't have this kind of sex, go get this vaccine without sort of a punchline or an explanation why it tended to be less effective. And so we saw the community in MPOX make a huge change in their behavior. Mm -hmm. Like 50% of them like reported massive changes in like the sex they were having and on the other and the risk that they were experiencing. And so much of that had to do with the fact that we had to sort of show that this is actually not just something that we're saying, but that we actually have data to back up the fact that this is how it's transmitting. And so we have this sort of next generation of this, which, which like, was on my list of questions, but I didn't yeah. get time to. So please, yeah. it's a great question. So, so we're we're at this point in the MPOX outbreak where we don't have a lot of cases. We have less than one case per day, but we also aren't getting a lot of vaccines done. And so, um, we sort of worked to come up with data to share, as well as modeling, and then linked it to our messaging that we're going to have for the spring. It just came out March thirty first. And so we release data on jurisdictions by jurisdiction vaccine coverage rate. So it's transparent, so everyone can see. On the same day, we release modeling. And the modeling says that the more you vaccinate, the less likely you are to have an outbreak. And if you have a thresh, uh, vaccine coverage rate of over 35%, the chance that you're gonna have a larger outbreak goes down by a lot. And so we then coupled those two things. Here's the problem here's what this could mean in terms of future outbreaks. And then we created this um, syndemic, and as I like to call it, HIV status neutral um, website that actually spans travel medicine, sexual health, HIV, um, people living with HIV, people who are at risk for HIV. So from the undetectable is equal to untransmittable universe into PrEP, MPOX, vaccinations for other, other uh, pathogens, updates on meningococcal disease, updates on Shigella, and then go all the way down to overdose pre pre uh, prevention in one place. And so it's responsive to the community um, to sort of hear that they wanna have like a one-stop shop to see what they need to know, but also show us the data to prove that we need to do this. Um, I would say that the lesson that I'm getting at is transparency is never wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like looking back, being as transparent as possible, as early as possible, could have probably driven us faster um, to some of the places that we needed to get to be able to control the outbreak. Thank you. I, that's a brilliant story. And I just love that example of using data and, and also just the trust of the community as well. Um, We're lucky. 
I'm gonna go over here and then I'll come back to Katie. Yes, I can't see whose hand is up. I've been really bad at this side. I it's know okay. you all are there. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, I'm bad on that side. Yeah, Same perfect. Thing. I've seen you all a lot. <laughs> Hi, um, so thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm wondering, um, you know, you're talking a lot about some very improved and very advanced, you know, surveillance of disease, but what is, you know, there must be a tension with the expansion of such surveillance methods into forms of sex that were criminal maybe 20 years ago. Um, and what is the responsibility that, you know, yourself and government and other medical professionals have in terms of making sure there are safeguards to such data and that people are not just perhaps maybe epidemiological like tools of the state? Yeah, I mean, I think this sort of reflects back into the HIV space because I think that um, HIV surveillance, as an example, really has a, a lots of safeguards. Um, in term, the data, as an example, um, tends to be the most secure. Like we've actually not had any release of the data, um, like for you know, like legal or other other sort of endeavors. I think that um, you know it, it's an expectation with our departments of health that we have very clear guidelines and guardrails around what can be done with, with data. The reality is, which is important to say, is the data is not owned by the federal government. The data is owned by the local jurisdiction. And so um, the, the good news is that because they're grantees, you're able, there's some, there's like some clear guidance around what they can do, but ultimately like some of the decisions are local. And so that's just the reality of the federal system that, that there's, you know, that the safeguards exist on the federal level um, for the data that sort of comes to the feds, but what's uh, locally administered, it's CDC and other organizations like that that actually pr pr um, create the guidelines. And it's, it's interesting, there's such a fun, an interesting tension that happens. Mm -hmm. So I, I think like right now, there's a lot of sort of discussion around the role of molecular surveillance in HIV as an example. Um, and interestingly, like the same folks who are sort of saying like, you know, we really need to put more safeguards around molecular surveillance, which I think is a great point, are actually also asking us for, can we do more molecular surveillance of MPOX? And so it's like, it's a, an interesting thing because the technology exists and the epidemiology and the skill exists. And the question is, how do you do it in a way that's respectful um, to the community and also safeguards their, you know, safeguards their privacy. And so, um, you know, the, the answer is like, that's one of the important roles of public health and governmental public health, which is to make sure that, um, that, that safeguards are in place and that standards are, are, are complied to. But we could have, this is like a whole other Barnes lecture. <laughs> well, and I'll, so I'll actually say, so I know we, we had a little conversation about kind of harm reduction and how sometimes it's easier to apply to some populations than to others. And I'll say I've increasingly not even been using the word surveillance. I know it's our word in public health, but when you talk to the community and whether it's around MPOX and STIs or whether it's around firearms and you start talking about surveillance, it means a camera. Right. If people are like, oh, what's, it, what's the government yeah, taking my data right. for? Right? So, yeah. I mean, we also, you know, like, the, the, we, we keep pushing the envelope. I mean, I know that um, wastewater, as an example, mm -hmm. in COVID has been really interesting. In polio, it made a big difference, right? right? And then now in MPOX, we have it. And, and, like, you have not lived until you launch, like, a new kind of surveillance in a disease. Or a new, right? So, literally, like, we have the surveillance. We made it maximally transparent. Right, we're like we are doing wastewater for MPOX, and it goes online, and everyone can see it. It's updated once a week, and then the next question you need to ask is, "And what are you doing about it?" Right. So we're all learning together because, yeah. you know, and it's been fascinating. And this is like a this is a little bit off the topic, but um, but you know, like we have one jurisdiction right now that shows consistent detection and zero cases reported in in a, in the lab. Ooh. And so you have not lived until you see this unfold in real life, sort of see how like a local jurisdiction works with CDC to figure out like what they're going to do. What are the best practices? And is there gonna be a protocol that's gonna come from it? Thinking like in a public health mechanism, like we're totally gonna to get an SOP out of this yeah. in terms of what to do in this situation. And it's <laughs> Every exciting. public health official's dream, an yeah, SOP. It's an like... SOP, <laughs> well, at least something. Cause like it's, it's just been, yeah, it's it's awesome. been so wild. We were like, well, there it is. And what do you do with it? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I, Dr. Biello, you had your hand up. I, I want to make sure we get time for you. And then I will look at this side. Yes, we, and then you will be our last question over here. So um, This is just 
hopefully a quick question, but you've um, told us a lot of how your work in HIV informed you, um, your work now in MPOX. And I'm just curious as to you know, some specific examples maybe of how your work in MPOX can you know, inform your future work in HIV. What oh my gosh, what a great question. So I feel like MPOX put our sort of community engagement strategy like into hyperdrive. And so you know, one of the things that we found was as an example, that we really didn't have um, you know, like individual level feedback from people that was easy to get. And so we had like big advisory committees, but like we, if we wanted to get a, a bunch of people together to get some feedback, we didn't have it. And so we actually pulled together at the White House a workshop, mainly um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and other um, folks from that community um, who were mainly people of color um, who just came together. It was, it's, a, it's a crew that changes and we just like convened them every month to just get like individual level feedback. And that's gonna stay with us in HIV. That's been really helpful to just like know how to calibrate a response based on like sort of real time by the populations who are overrepresented in the outbreak. Um, I think the other part, um, really all of the outbreak responses that I've had an experience um, working on one of the things in MPOX that has been important is that um, I'm kind of thinking of it as a little bit of a dress rehearsal for an HIV vaccine. Mm. It's gonna do the same thing, the exact same thing. All white guys are gonna get it. Yeah. Black and Latino individuals will not. It will be a combination of, of, of access issues as well as stigma issues, right? It, I, 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 can only imagine the lines that will happen yeah. where like it will be twinning the idea that somehow you're at risk for HIV and you're in line. So I just have this, you know, this like, this is an important dress rehearsal to get some of the kinks out. So we're ready to go um, in the event that we do have that good news. Um, we I should be so lucky. We should be so lucky, but it is a dress rehearsal. And I think the other part is really, um, I, feel like one of the exciting things, you should ask Dr. Jaw this as well when, he, when he's here, but um, is that by being in a response that you're not just within one agency, but you're like looking overall, um, you get to actually like, just like the police guy from Boston, meet all these people who are gonna be really helpful in your um, North Star response when you go back. So like meeting people in the universe of like rapid diagnostic um, creation like has been amazing, like really dealing with the people in housing in a different way. So all of those relationships are gonna come back, I think, because they're just so critical in, in uh, a syndemic response to HIV. So fun. And last but not least. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for speaking today. So much of what you said about following your North Star resonates with me as somebody early in their academic public health career. Um, my question, um, you were speaking a lot about your emergency responses to MPOX, to COVID, to HIV, and as somebody interested in child and adolescent mental health and food insecurity and thinking about non-transmissible chronic diseases, what are some of the key pillars of these responses that you think should be brought into responses to these yeah. other epidemics? In the so US? I'm a clumper, not a splitter, which you'll see sort of in my like sort of in my career in general. Like I tend to be more of a clumper. Yep. So when I see sort of when you're asking me about like things that have to do with like housing insecurity or food insecurity, like those are infectious disease prevention, if we work with them, if we work together to be able to optimize those scenarios. So in that sort of syndemic model, I always sort of compare it to like a ball. So HIV interacts with MPOX, which interacts with mental health, which interacts with STI. And there's like something biological about them that makes, makes you know, MPOX worse if you have HIV. But it doesn't do a thing until racism, homophobia, transphobia, housing insecurity, food insecurity, really then galvanize this thing into a, a, a highly, highly dense mass that has extraordinary impact on the communities that, um, that feel it. So, so I think that you can't really do communicable disease public health without a very clear relationship and connection with non-communicable issues in public health. I look at sort of the work that we're doing in the syndemic space and also think about like the aspirational work that's happening internationally in PEPFAR 
they're asking the same question you're asking, which is like, how can we embed within this HIV response really concern for, you know, like maternal fetal health? How can we embed within their concern about housing and food security and stigma? Like, so, so I think really it's, it's identifying like where there's those bridges and those links where you can leverage resources from one side to do the work on the other. So, I mean, I feel like one of the, fun parts about, so my, my reputation in HIV is pretty interesting because I'm the um, HIV public health person who wants you to spend my money on housing. I love it. It's true. Like they think I'm crazy and I'm like, no, no. No, if you want to stop transmission, you've got to address the reason. Yeah, so like if you yeah. want to use this money to be able to sort of, you know, help people get employed, great. Cause so, so really it's like, it's like thinking about where there's leverage points and how you can build more bridges and relationships. And so I think that very often in departments of health, certainly on the federal level, like we're pretty well siloed. And so really working to, as a leader in public health, trying to build those bridges rather than maintain those silos, because like it is a, a one mission to be able to sort of address people's needs. Like nobody, like a homeless person can't care about HIV they're worried about where they're gonna sleep, right? Food insecurity, you're not gonna go, gee, I wanna start Truvada for prep. Like, you know, so it's, it's you have to deal with those parts and it means being, being close and friends and actually having communication and, and, and being strategic. And again, it's this idea that public health is so much more than either a department of health, halls of academia, or even the discipline of public health to begin with. I love it. Um, well, thank you so much. I cannot thank you. deeply enough express my appreciation. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Um, I am going to invite all of you to please stay with us. He is here and ready for more questions. I know looking around that many of you probably have other questions and ideas. Um, please take advantage of our having this amazing guest. Um, have a drink, uh, have some cheese. <laughs> and uh, thank you for coming out. And a huge thank you. I actually want to say a huge thank you to Karen Scanlon and to our entire events team here at the School of Public Health. Thank you. Um, we would not be able to do this without you. So, so appreciative. Talk about teamwork. So thank you, guys.